Welcome to the AOA podcast series on lessons in leadership. My name is Ann Van Heest, and I am honored to serve as the AOA president. As we discussed in our August podcast, part of my AOA presidential duties include joining the Orthopedic Carousel of Presidents from five English-speaking countries and attending each of their annual meetings. The American Orthopedic Association is a leadership organization, and one of the annual meetings that I am excited to attend is the Australian Orthopedic Association meeting. This will be in Melbourne, Australia from November 12th through 15th, 2023. I am pleased and honored to host the other AOA 2023 president, Dr. Chris Morey, for our podcast today to discuss lessons in leadership from his vantage point. Thank you, Chris, for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure, Anne. As we discuss, we can learn so much from leaders of other countries. The diversity of our profession includes the diversity of orthopedic surgery in other countries of the world in order to compare and contrast to our own. Can you start by telling us a little bit about the Australian AOA and your membership? Sure. So like most of the organisations throughout the uh, orthopaedic world, our organisation is a membership organisation. I think at last count we've got uh, 1,909 members, so we're nowhere near on the scale of some of the bigger organisations in the world, such as uh, your organisation. And of that, we've probably got about um, 1,530 who we'd consider to be active members who are actively practising in orthopaedic surgery. And there would be, there's a group of 237 of those who form our trainee component. Mm. Of those, when we start to talk about diversity within our organisation, unfortunately, I think the AOA has probably been lagging behind the, or dragging the chain, as we sort of would call it in Australia, in that 5% of our uh, active members are uh, female. And... We have had, we are, we've got programs in place and we've been doing uh, a fair amount of work uh, within this space and so this year we've uh, increased our trainees up to uh, 20% uh, mm -hmm. a female. So although those numbers are not great, it's certainly a, I wouldn't call it a massive increase, but I'd certainly call it a, a, a head in a positive direction for trying to uh, improve the, 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 or the percentage or the numbers of female orthopaedic surgeons you know, we have in Australia. And then secondly, from that, we'd, we'd sort of look at the diversity within our membership. And I mean, one of my particular aims, having been involved with our cultural inclusion uh, group over the last three or four years as their sort of foundation committee chair, is not only looking at that, but looking at our population as a whole and where we should be heading as far as diversity goes uh, within our organisation as well, including outside the realm of, uh, of gender. And uh, what particular populations are there in Australia that you would like to have reflected in the um, workforce of orthopaedic surgeons? Well, the obvious ones probably looking at it is the Indigenous population we have. So our um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are our First Peoples Nations. There are not a lot of First Peoples Nations in Australia as a percentage of the population, probably around 2 to 3%. So I suppose, you know, if you look harshly at that, you know, why would we be sort of putting ourselves out to try and increase, you know, for the number of two or three surgeons, which we may gain if we look at population statistics. But the problem runs much deeper than that in that, uh, we, you know, our healthcare delivery to our Indigenous populations, a lot of them live in very rural and remote areas, is very poor. And it's certainly been shown that they respond trustworthy-wise a lot better to... Um, to actually being cared for by members of their own um, culture and certainly we can learn as far as uh, treating physicians that you know there are cultural sensitivities and things that need to be uh, particularly followed or acknowledged in the management of this these patients it's not just showing up and having an indigenous surgeon there to operate on someone or or providing a, a non-indigenous surgeon to a community to, to provide health care the the problems and the understandings run a lot deeper, I think. And so have there been disparities in health care for orthopedic surgery that have been described? And do you have ideas about how those can be addressed? Yep. So, I mean, part of my presidency, well, the whole 
uh, topic or theme of my presidency this year is rural surgery, build it and they will come, because 30% of the Australian population lives in a regional area and the other 70% live in major cities scattered along the seaboards. The middle of Australia is basically a desert. But only 12% of uh, surgeons live in a regional area. Then there's about another or oh, 8 to 10% who may provide fly-in, fly-out visits to those areas. So there is a there is an issue with both provision of service to regional and rural areas to improve the health of those people living there because there are certainly implications and higher rates of things like heart disease, diabetic related complications in regional rural areas compared to the big cities in Australia. Let's talk about the upcoming Australian Orthopaedic Association meeting. I know that, as you mentioned, disparities in health care for the Indigenous population is a major focus area for you. Can you tell us about your upcoming meeting and some of the things that will be topics we'll be covering? Yeah, well, part of the, uh, the issue is trying to encourage and to highlight the workforce discrepancy we have amongst our orthopaedic surgeons, and we have a rural committee made up of surgeons you know coming from rural communities who've sort of got their heads around you know from first-hand experience as to what they've experienced has been well why they went there in the first place the challenges that they have found and things that we've tried to highlight in that if we're going to attract people to come to those areas that we think we might be able to improve so we have a, uh, a rural regional strategy which is going to be uh, highlighted at the meeting which basically involves around sort of three pillars. One is, you know, the attractiveness of and support within a community, the mentorship that is available in those areas. And, and part of the issue, I suppose, we've got, and this might reflect a bit back on the training and, and what's expected of, of how we call them registrars, when they finish their training is that they should be able to be able to perform a safe degree of surgery and orthopaedic practice in a regional centre. That's what our training is aimed at. But I'm not quite sure whether psychologically we're, we're achieving that because a lot of our registrars then sub or new consultants then subspecialise and they feel that taking those subspecialties to a regional area is they're not going to get the exposure to the number of cases they may need to become experts in that area. They don't feel prepared that if they've subspecialised over a couple of years that they can take general on call, which is sort of a requirement in that sort of area. So there's the intellectual and professional side of it. There's the schooling side of it. They you know, want to provide an environment for their children if they have them and, and also uh, growing opportunities for their partners' careers as well. One would have hoped that maybe COVID might have taught us that you, know, you can achieve lots of things from rural. I mean, in Australia, there was an enormous volume of people that left cities and moved to regional areas because regional areas didn't have the exposure that the cities had to COVID. You could drive your car to walk, you could walk around, you know, you didn't have to wear a mask type sort of thing. So people moved to regional areas, enormous quick volume of growth, but that sort of has started to fall back off again. And I suppose the gains maybe we thought we could make with a limited amount of work and effort probably isn't going to occur anymore. Well, as you mentioned, I don't know if we call it a conflict, but the rub between training and or being a specialist versus a generalist has been an issue that I think has been part of the orthopedic associations across the world. I think you are a generalist. Yep. As a leadership podcast, we're interested in your journey to becoming president of the AOA. Can you tell us a little bit, as a general orthopedic surgeon, how have you managed your journey and do you have any tips for any young leaders in our organization? Yeah, I suppose tips would be, tips is an interesting one. So, I mean, I was, I was born and raised in a city. I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia. I went to a private boys' school. I had a very, you know, privileged life. But then I didn't get into medical school straight out of school, you know, I missed, I didn't perform very well in one of my examinations and so I was forced to sort of reevaluate what I wanted to do. I, I went to uni and I did another, I did an honours degree in science which I suppose in America you guys might call that doing pre-med. Um, and then I got into a university away from where I lived in, an, in another state in Queensland so I went to Queensland and our exposure through Queensland was to go to regional areas um, as medical students and I had some good experiences there and then 
So we landed, drove to far north Queensland and landed in a place called Cairns and looked around and thought, oh, wouldn't it be really strange and weird and maybe a big adventure to spend a year working there as a, as a, as a junior doctor? So I did. We sort of fell in love with it. I went overseas and I did a fellowship in pelvic and acetabular trauma and some spinal trauma. And then I was offered a job back in Brisbane as a result of that in a subspecialist group. And then my wife said to me, why can't the people of Cairns and the far north region have that service provided to them? I don't think she quite knew what that would mean as far as... <laughs> where you would live. Work time and commitments and things. You know, she knew where we were going to live, but then all of a sudden I became the only person sort of north of Brisbane, you know, within 1,600, 1,800 kilometres. So that had its repercussions on family life a bit, extra on call, those sorts of things. But the evolution of that was that we established those services in a rural or regional area, and we were then able to attract other surgeons, you know, who'd subspecialised in things like foot and ankle, upper limb, who realised they could have a practice in that area. And as a result of that, we got more trainees, accredited training positions. So we've now got four accredited training positions in our hospital, which is more than any other regional hospital in the country has, and a lot more than some of the city hospitals. Mm. We have a, an enormous number of non-training registrars, which in Australia, before they get appointed to a training program, they'll spend several years working as junior orthopaedic registrars in areas. So we get a large volume wanting to come and work in Cairns because they get good exposure, they get a lot of uh, responsibility, and they're now starting to be selected on the training program. So it's a process, I yeah. suppose. Of, um, so that's brought in a, a lot of growth, it sounds like, to your regional centre. Yep. And then how did you evolve to being a national leader? The first thing was probably my involvement with AO, the AO organisation in Switzerland. Um, I sent a patient back to Sydney that uh, a, a couple actually had been involved in a terrible motor vehicle accident who'd just been very badly smashed up. And uh, I sent them back to Sydney and uh, about six weeks later, the surgeon I'd sent them back to rang me up and said, oh, would you like to come and teach on the AO course in Sydney this year? I went, well, that'd be great, thanks. I said, why me? And he said, well, well, you put these two people back together really well, but the other thing was you rang me and told them they were coming back to my hospital. So I suppose my involvement in, uh, in that sort of sphere started with AO and then it sort of progressed through AO, and I don't know whether I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but there were some leadership positions as AO changed its constitution from being a central organisation based in Switzerland where they wanted to take it globally. So the Asia-Pacific region was one of those nominated regions, and they wanted some leaders, and uh, I was just asked whether I'd be prepared to, to chair the AO-Pacific Internet or Trauma Board which I had very little skills in doing that, but I saw it as an opportunity. So I took that on and, and I had some very good mentors through that uh, process. And I suppose when you get involved and you get exposed in those areas, you either sink or swim. And I think you either enjoy it or you don't enjoy it. So I enjoyed that, but I also enjoyed that I enjoyed the teaching side. So I was able to combine both of those. Yeah. And then leadership. It's tricky because people ask you this question. They go, what makes a good leader? And I said, well, I think I just lead by example. You know, I've always worked hard. You know, if you look at the work-life balance, probably, you know, you and I are at that age where for a long time we probably didn't get work-life balance the right way and our families suffered and our, our friends, but I suppose our patients got the benefit of that. So I think I've just always led by example and tried to, and the major reason for me doing this job or uh, going, applying to, well, putting myself up for election was I wanted to encourage people that you could go to a regional area and you could have a really good professional career and you could have a really good family life if you got the work-life balance and that you could do this job as a busy orthopaedic surgeon with, you know, you're going to have to reduce some things if you want to do that. Because I think it's really important at the moment, particularly in Australia, we have all these issues both on the public side of our medical treatments, uh, on our private side, medico-legally, research, universities. There's, you know, there's a lot of, lot of things that can potentially go wrong 
and unless you've got your leaders all over these problems or surrounded by people who understand how these problems go, you know, that can lead to disaster for healthcare, which ultimately is going to affect the care of our patients. Yeah, it certainly sounds like leadership, your leadership journey has been hallmarked by leading by example, and that example being that you can be a regional medical uh, provider and be part of the national. Mm. I think I'll say, I think having mentors along the way is very important. So, you know, when I went to Cairns, there were, there were, one of the reasons I went back as an orthopaedic surgeon is that there were two orthopaedic surgeons who'd looked after me as a registrar and as a friend. You know, so I think that's very important in people's journeys that they that they have good mentors. Yeah. So. Well, you mentioned that there are a number of uh, different issues facing Australian orthopedics right now. And uh, as you know, that our AOA is committed to identifying and discussing critical is issues in orthopedic surgery. What do you see as the critical issues uh, facing the, your AOA at this time? I think, well, the first thing is the we had issues with waiting lists. So in Australia, we have a public hospital system and a private hospital system. Many people go, oh, you've got this two-tiered system. Well, it's not a two-tiered system. It's there's some patients choose to take out private health insurance and they're treated within the private system. And then we have a public hospital system which is funded by our federal and state governments uh, within each state. So there's almost like a safety net for, for those patients. So, And what happens in those two systems is sort of completely different as far as waiting times, you know, private insured patients get to see their doctor, they choose, they get their operation done within a reasonable amount of time. And what's a reasonable amount of time in well, Australia? Well, I suppose it depends so. on how popular you are in private insurance <laughs> and where you live. You so know, for, if I came to you for a total knee arthroplasty, yeah. what would, what well, would the you, wait time be? It would probably be three to six months to see me in my rooms, but then you'd probably get your surgery within six weeks. That's on the private side. That's on the private side. Whereas if you're on the public side, you don't get a choice. You go into a waiting list, and it could be, depending on where you are in the country and what the workforce and services were, it could be between anywhere between three to five years before you get your surgery done. So as you and can imagine... And in would that be true? Car sorry? In your region? In Cairns, yeah. It's probably even worse because we don't have... We have one public hospital, which is basically running at a 100% capacity and maximum we have we have enough surgeons we could do with more surgeons but it requires the government to accept that there is no there's really no short-term solution to this problem because we can't increase our capacity in some parts of the country they've been able to increase their capacity by taking some of the work into the private sector we have a private hospital uh, which basically runs at full capacity now and they're building they have two more operating theaters coming online but because we've been encouraging surgeons to come to a regional area, you have to have an ability for them to be able to practice, yeah. you know, whether that's in orthopaedics or whatever. We've had an interesting thing happen, and ours isn't the first regional centre, where we've had to shut down our private obstetric and gynaecology service because the young uh, obstetricians don't want to go into... To, private practice they want to find it more amenable to go into public practice where they can work in a large group might be 20 or 30 surgeons obviously massive reduction in on call reasonably good remuneration so they can have a good life and the thing that that's carried on with is that trying to find a private paediatrician in a regional area now is almost impossible for the same reason they'll go to the public hospital for a gov government funded job rather than uh, try the rigors of private practice so we actually may see in Australia, because of the distances and things, sort of different evolving healthcare systems to what we've been used to. Well, and it sounds like with the workforce issues that are facing Australia between both your public and private sector, a lot of that has to do with training the next generation. Our AOA membership includes many leaders that are committed to educating competent orthopedic surgeons and we're just rolling out COMC-based education in the United States, but I know that you have a lot more experience with that. What is your experience and what advice might you have for us? So we looked at our training back in 2012 and decided to take an evaluation and look across the world as to what was 
considered to be the gold standard. We've always prided ourselves that we have a very high standard of, of training and medical care in our country. And it came out of the investigation that was done by the education guys within the AOA that probably competency-based training was going to be the most effective way to train. And at that period in time, Canada was the world leader. So we actually got a couple of people, well, internationally renowned surgeons within this realm. Jason Frank from Canada was one of them Mm -hmm. and brought them to Australia. And we had some workshops where they sort of showed the basic, the pillars. Then we put this out to our um, membership and we had members comment, make suggestions And so over a period of about 18 months to two years, we developed this competency-based training program. But then the issue was it's a completely, it turns traditional training on its head. So we then had to go out and run education sessions for the people in our membership who are going to be our trainers. In Australia, all orthopaedic training supervision is done voluntarily. It's not controlled by universities or anything along those lines. It's what's controlled by the AOA. So we have a a signed um, agreement with the Royal Australian College of Surgeons that will be responsible for the selection and training of our registrars. So Mm. we developed this competency-based training program which runs over five years and the bottom pillar is on things like advocacy, communication, diversity, patient care, which are emphasised in the introductory models but then they're incorporated to the subsequent models that come along which is, you know, divided into six main core areas. And so then once the uh, registrars uh, finish their first year, then they go into a three-year what we call core training where they're exposed across the board to the seven core areas. You know, for instance, that might be hip, knee and spine in one unit, shoulder, elbow, wrist and hand in another unit, paediatrics, tumours in another. And that... At the end of that three years, they then sit their fellowship exam, uh, which allows them then to proceed to the final year of training, which is a thing we've called transition to practice, Mm. which is where we try and educate them in the realms of establishing a private practice, what to do, getting involved in early leadership activities, and also looking that if they were thinking about going to regional areas... Did they need to brush up on something? Like, Did they felt that during their training they'd had enough, for instance, hand surgery? And so there would be a concerted effort to make sure that they got those rotations within the hospitals they were working at. It's not a time for them to go overseas and to do fellowships because they're still training. And then they would do that afterwards. So it's a five-year program. So it's a five-year program. And that five-year program finished last year... So the first cohort, the first that cohort started came through. at yeah. the initial. And was that a, you said that it kind of turned yeah. head over heels. That was significantly different than what you had done yeah. previously. Yeah. So the difference, you know, so part, some of the problems that have been highlighted in the review, which was done this year, was that the amount of paperwork that's required or administrative side of this, both on the trainee but now also on the trainer, was quite onerous to the point where some people just said, I'm not Not going to do it. And so without the trainers being involved, this isn't going to work. So the burden, Yeah, the burden. burden. So we have a thing called an app on people's phones, but the problem thing is that sometimes your phones don't work in an operating theatre, as we know, you know, deep in the bowels. And unless you do that sort of review or assessment at that particular point in time, then the longer the delay is, you know, if you can get right. out of theatre. So it needs to be real-time assessment. So there's been big issues with communication. It's certainly what we've, in the accreditation of our training places, we've realised we probably have to be a little bit more flexible in, we can't have a stock standard accreditation level for every hospital, like a hospital, for instance, in Cairns, their accreditation may have to be different from the trauma hospital in the middle of Sydney, as far as you know, how a registrar is supervised, how many operations can they do, can they get exposure to this. And then there's also been the gaming of all human beings are adaptable to the situation that yeah. they're in. Whenever you set up rules, someone figures out how someone to Someone figures around. out how to do it. So the, yeah. reg- the registrars will just look at their, their logbooks and go, well, you know, I haven't done my ankle fracture yet. And so instead of they'll just be seeking out cases to do rather than sitting down and actually thinking about 
I need to do this because I need to know how to do an ankle fracture and how am I going to be taught. So rather than just doing things slowly and perhaps doing five or six ankle fractures, they'll just get the whatever numbers they need I see. and move on to the next level. So that's been a bit of an issue. So the gaming of the system has been a little bit of a, has been a problem as well. And so when you're setting up the framework of what it takes to train to be a competent orthopedic surgeon, are you setting up by case number or do they need to be evaluated and get an assessment at a certain level of independent surgery? So they get evaluated at each level of their training. So one of the issues with trainers has been you know, a year one trainee cannot be expected to be as good as a year four trainee, but some people have a, a difficulty in assessing them on that basis. They yeah. just assess them as well, you know, and so they fail that particular operation or, or whatever instead of it. Maybe if it was a teaching session, you know, it should have been, have you ever done a hemiarthroplasty of the hip? Well, I've done a couple. Okay, show me how you do the approach. Let's do the approach and then I'll do that, you know, and then it's a gradual. And that's what I was saying about the, the competency and the gaming of just to get a type of operation in yeah. your logbook so that it can be ticked off rather than looking at it as, as an edu- from an educational point of view. Well, and this importance of training the trainers. Yeah. And then it has to be intellectually and career satisfying to be part of the process. process. And if the burden is too high, that, yeah, that it sounds like it's been an issue. Yep. So the whole point of our training program is that you should finish your training. And most people would assume that at the end of that first four years of training, when you sit the exam, you should be able to go out and practice safely in a regional area in Australia. And do you feel like your system with this first cohort of individuals that has gone through the new five-year program do you feel like you've achieved that yeah it's difficult I mean it's only we've only had one year and the second year the second year's just been and I suppose you know if you want a hard way to define has the training be successful then you look at the pass rate of the the fellowship exam and although it's not statistically significant the pass rates appear to be higher than they have been in the past oh so they're they're sort of slipping up into the high 70s early 80s where they haven't been before. So that could just be some years are like that, and some, but until we get a, you know, a good five to 10 year picture. Right. Um, and so what is the plan for Australia moving forward as far as the competency-based medical education? Okay, so we've had a review. Uh, we, don't include, we haven't included selection in this review because we review our selection every year as a separate entity trying to make things better for everyone. I mean, no system of selections perfect but for, as far as the competency-based training you know we'll go back to the board with our education committee and they'll based on the recommendations that have come out of this review you know there'll be further protocols and things written there's be more work on trying to decrease that burden of paperwork around the assessments making the assessments quicker faster more relevant so there'd, there'd be that, there'd be the education of the importance of a competency-based training in order to make you a competent orthopaedic surgeon. It's not a sort of a criteria of, of, of training. And I suppose that's, that's the hangover from the old training system that we used to do. You know, our old training system was four years. So you would spend three years on average working as a non-training registrar. In that time, you would have to sit a basic surgical sciences exam uh, before you could even be considered. You'd get on the training program, you'd sit another exam in your first year of training, so most people would spend their whole time studying for that. They weren't getting good training. They'd then have about 12 or 18 months worth of probably good training, and then suddenly it was time to start studying for the fellowship exam. <laughs> so, you know, you'd disappear off the face of the earth for 12 months, you'd show up to work, be trying to do lease on call and all those things, then you'd pass your exam in May and then no one would ever see you again. So. It's, it's a big turn on its head from that, but yeah. that, that was all sort of time-based and goal-based orientated, whereas I think competency-based training, is, it's like your career. Yeah. It's, you know, when you finish your training, you can do most things reasonably well or get you around, but, you know, as we were talking about today, you don't know what a complication is. You don't know how to deal with a complication both physically and mentally. There are all these other issues that the competency-based training is trying to introduce into training to try and prepare you 
to be a better surgeon to deal with those things. I mean, surgery, surgery, but you know, the best surgeons are the ones that are, are, are good at what they do, but they're also the ones that know which patients to operate on and then how to deal with things when they go wrong. Yeah, well, that certainly is a challenge, and it's, uh, we appreciate the fact that you have been paving the path for this, and certainly the lessons you've learned about burden is something that the American AOA is um, taking under strong consideration as we try to move forward with competency-based medical education. Well, thank you, Chris, for joining me today for this conversation. I think your leadership journey and your experience in the Australian AOA helps uh, broaden the mindset of our AOA members and allows greater appreciation of the diversity of orthopedic surgery across the world. It has been my privilege to spend time with you discussing these important issues, and I really look forward to the upcoming Australian meeting. Thanks, Anne. It's been a, a privilege, and I, and I must say that I think the exchange of ideas and, and conversations and, and recognition uh, throughout all our different countries of the people we've all come across and met and spent time over the last 12 months just shows that everyone is in basically the same boat. Mm -hmm. And I think the more uh, cross-fertilisation and help we get from each other allows and sharing our experiences can only be better for our, our patients and hopefully our healthcare systems in the long run. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris.